Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Charlie. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I'm Charlie. And I want to thank the committee for inviting me to be here, Andrew, and, and the group. It's uh, really an honor to be asked to participate for a really enthusiastic group. It's not a big deal to participate for a group that's on the brink of a coma, but um, <laughs> you guys certainly are not that. Um, um, I also want to thank the battalion of people who showed up at the airport to get me on uh, last night. There were about 25 people there. Uh, it was very peculiar, really <laughs> awesome, and I want to thank Daniel for having, I, every time I turn around, he's got a fresh cup of coffee for me, so um, I've had about six quarts of coffee, and I don't, know what, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know whether to talk or do a few numbers from Riverdance, um, <laughs> where to go, um, we just had a nice meal, and, and boy, I wish I was hearing a different speaker tonight, but... Um, <laughs> On behalf of my California compatriots, I want to thank you for the snowstorm you arranged for us. Um, it's it's great. Uh, I, I know I mean no harm by saying that. I uh, I just thought it was beautiful. Um, we don't get that kind of stuff where we are, so that's really. Uh, it was 75 when I left yesterday. Uh, yeah, but you know what? It's it's 75 over and over and over again. It's really boring. <laughs> So um, I'm I'm an alcoholic. I I have no other issues. That's pretty much the extent of mine. I, um, I we were coming back here, and and a guy in front of us, or a guy coming from another street, fishtailed into the snow and did a really nice little Brody around the corner. And uh, I was thinking, one time I came out of a blackout um, with. I was in, I, I, I drove for about 15 years this, or about 20 years, this beat up 1967 Volkswagen bug. And I came out of a blackout on the Newport Freeway in Orange County, going about 90 miles an hour. It, it, this thing was pegged. It couldn't go any faster than that. And I was pulling with all my might toward the window on the steering wheel while my passenger, a coworker, pulled with all his might in the other direction. And we were both laughing at the... Like, and I said, what's funny? And he said, we both have to let go at exactly the same time. And... I just thought of that tonight when that guy was going around the corner. I thought, oh, that's, it, it looks, in, from a sober position, shame on you. From the old days, dude. <laughs> um, <laughs> because even though I could not be one myself, I love the lawless. Um, I'm, I am a rebel. I just, I, I just don't tell anybody. But I um, <laughs> grew up in, in Orange County, which is certainly... Uh, a city best seen from a rearview mirror, as I heard someone say. And um, and I had a, a fairly ordinary childhood. Um, my parents, my dad was a drill instructor in the Marine Corps. Uh, my mom was a housewife at the time. And um, we lived in the, we had, my dad was also a carpenter. He, he was a Marine Corps, in the Marine Corps about eight years. And then uh, he became a carpenter. And my parents had no education. My dad had about a fourth grade, third grade education, enough to learn to read and write and do math, and that was it. And my mom had about an eighth grade education. So there was really, um, you know, there's working class people, really hardcore working class people. And um, I was born into that family. Uh, my mom had had four pregnancies, and three of them died at birth. And I understood what Larry was talking about uh, today when he was talking about his, his uh anticipation and expectation when he was thinking there was going to be a brother in the house or a sibling in the house. And I went through the same thing when I was about eight years old. I, my mom was pregnant and she went to the hospital and I was ready, you know, and I went down to, I remember staying at the Klein's house down the street and, 
and laying in bed at night facing the wall in the strange house, scared to death, and praying to God, please let everything be okay this time. Please, because my mom always talked about the two that died before me. And uh, please let it be all right. And then the next day, nobody came home, and then no one said anything. And then the day after, they told me I could go home. But don't wake up your mom because she's resting, and, and uh, don't talk about anything. And no one ever told me what was going on. And in my mind, I realized I just clicked off the idea that there was a God who answers kids' prayers. You know, that that was such a line of crap that got fed to me by the church or whoever. But God doesn't listen to little kids. Obviously, I asked for something and he didn't give it to me. So I was, I just think I must somewhere along the line, I just tuned out my belief in that power. I knew it was there. I just knew it wasn't for me. And um, I went through Catholic, uh, it, I had Catholic training and, and had the sacraments in the Catholic Church, and, and uh, I had a pretty fair childhood. I, I was sick a lot, though, and I missed a lot of school. And uh, uh, luckily, I was good in spelling, which which helped me out with girls later on. But I uh, <laughs> I um, managed to get through school with passing, and but I was always operating uh, what the teachers would say was beneath my potential. I don't know if there are any other sufferers of potential in here. Um, but I remember being brought into priest's offices and teacher's offices and counselor's offices all through my years and being told by by somebody behind a desk with a big fat cum folder, you know, Charles uh, has a lot of potential. We just don't understand why he doesn't do anything with it. He's telling my parents this, you know, and I'm sitting there. But my reaction was the same every time I heard that, and that was, all right, I know I've got potential. Now my mom and dad know I've got potential. Thank you. And you know I've got potential. So why don't we just, why don't you just back it up a little bit and let me use my potential when I'm goddamn good and ready to use it? <laughs> Do you think I'm going to jump through that hoop just because you shook it in front of me? I'll use my potential. I will. But when I use it, I hope you're wearing sunglasses, Skippy, because I'm going to light you up. <laughs> But until I choose to use my potential, why don't you go wipe your idiot concern for it on some other sap? Because if you were such hot shit, you wouldn't be a high school counselor, now would you? <laughs> um, it never came out in exactly those words. Um, I usually said something like, I'll try harder. But um, I've always been vexed with that desire to just do this to the whole world, you know, just always... No matter what, because I don't, I, every, I don't even like doing that because people don't like you if you do that. It's very important for me to be liked, even though I hate the major population of the, of the universe. But I uh, just did not like people at all. I thought they were vicious. I, I read, I read newspapers ever since I was a little kid, and there's nothing good in there about what people do to each other. You seldom hear somebody doing each other a favor in the paper. And I, I, I just knew people were bad. They just had bad natures. They were flawed, weak saps. And um, I hated them. The only problem was I needed their approval, on the other hand, <laughs> which will give, that'll give you some torque, you know, in your life. Because I was constantly angry at the world and yet still wanting to be approved of by the world, which, where does that come from? I think alcoholics understand that, that contradiction. I was always a loner, too, because I, I got to spend a lot of time alone as an only child. I, everything was for me. It was my world. And... Um, I had no problem spending time alone. I preferred it. I was never lonely. I just enjoyed spending time by myself out of the influence of others. And uh, I graduated from high school with no notoriety whatsoever. Um, I immediately went into the record industry, the music industry. As a, a, I was a clerk at a record store, but I, um, <laughs> I was um, working there in Fullerton, California, when, when these guys from my high school who were sort of the, uh, the troublemakers. And I've always had... A, a real admiration for troublemakers. I, I think troublemakers are cool. I like guys who wear primary chain belts. I like to be friends with these guys. Um, and I, I, I like girls with tattoos. Sorry, Larry. Um, but um, I, I like, I like that. I like that. No, I, I really respect and like that defiant mindset because I have it. I just don't tell anyone. You know. I'm defiant. I'd just rather not say it to be polite so you won't dislike me. So I feel this, 
but I don't do this. I do this. And, and all it does is just, it just builds up, you know, and, um, and these guys that came into the store asked me if I wanted to go to a party, and I did. I went to this party. I'd never been to a party before because, as I understood it, there would be you know, others at the party. And, and so um, <laughs> we don't want that to happen. But um, I went to this party. Uh, my buddy John, who I was a rock drummer uh, in a band, and he had girls climbing all over him. And I thought, if I could just catch some of the outflow from that, I'd, I'd be happy. But because um, I've always been on hormone alert, and um, but at the time I was six foot two and 127 pounds uh, of of just riveting testosterone. And, um, <laughs> but I was just sad. I mean, John didn't even have to look at these girls; they were after him, and I I was always looking, and I I was looked at. People forgot me while they were shaking my hand. Uh, so I, I decided to go to this party, and, and uh, I went there, and it was exactly what I expected, you know. It was a bunch of people, and they were, I was in a, 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 this Victorian house in Santa Ana, California, and half the room was drunk. This is 1968. Half the room was drunk, and half the room was on acid. And they were all convinced they were having conversations. And there was a mirror ball and the MC5 playing on the stereo. I remember that vividly. And I stood there, and I hated every second of it. From the moment I walked in there, I thought, oh, great. The same congregation of losers that I've always hated. Now I'm in the middle of this. How did I get myself into this? I thought maybe it would be, I had expectations of it being more interesting. It wasn't interesting at all. I wanted to use the bathroom, and there were people doing it in the bathtub. I went into, it was just, it was like something out of a Fellini movie. It was just weird. And, I, and it made me kind of sick to my stomach, the part that didn't completely turn me on. But I, uh, uh, <laughs> but I uh, was standing there. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about real revulsion at, at being there. I just thought, I don't fit in. I don't belong to this group. I don't have any connection with these guys. They're all exactly as I pictured people to be. They're self-interested, they're, they're idiotic, they act stupid, they're all drunk and they're all loaded, and it's just loser ram and I'm ashamed to be part of this generation. And somebody came by and handed me a can of malt liquor coming through, just handing out, popping, you know, cans of malt liquor out of this container, and, and I took it and I thought, oh, this is great. What am I going to do, start acting like you? You know, oh, goody. But I, I couldn't get anything else to drink in there, so I started drinking this can of malt liquor, and I realized as I got about halfway through that can of malt liquor that I've been way too hard on you people. <laughs> um, it just all of a sudden crept up my back that this was not a bad group of people. This was an energetic gathering of young folks that, you know, and I drank the rest of that can of malt liquor because you, you and I, I was, I felt great. I felt like I was radiating joy while I stood there. All my expectations were fulfilled. I didn't even know what they were. They were just like a checklist, you know, everything that I'd never experienced this before. I'd never felt this way before. I felt like I, as if I were able to just unzip the costume that I was wearing of me and jump out and say, this is the real me. This is how I really am. That husk over there, I don't want to be like that anymore. This is really me, really me. And I felt alive. I felt for the first time as, that I could ever remember that I wasn't worried about what was going to happen tomorrow and living in dreaded anticipation of that. And I wasn't feeling embarrassed and, and rerunning everything that happened yesterday or moments before. I was just there. I was there. You know. And if, if you're new, you know where there is. And if you're 35 years sober, you know where there is too. And for you who are new, who think that we forget after years of sobriety what you experienced when you were drinking, we never forget. I never have forgotten what that can of malt liquor felt like. I've forgotten what it tasted like, but I remember what it felt like. And I was there. I was good and there. In it. I was in that moment. You know, just I was the point man for living right there. And, uh, I, was, I was conversational and charming, and the Irish came out of me, and I was just wonderful mixture of John Lennon and Bob Dylan and David David uh, Niven 
and and Errol Flynn, you know, all rolled up. It was hard to pull off when you look like Sherman from the Mr. Peabody cartoons, but um, I was giving it my best shot. I mean, I was alive, you know, for the very first time, and and man, I drank that night. I drank into a blackout, of course, and I just remember coming out of the blackout, holding on to my my friend John. Eventually, wanted to leave, but I'd been, I was there, you know, and I'm not leaving there. And I had a hold of the door handle of his car, running down the street, vomiting all over myself and laughing my ass off because I had been to the mountaintop, you know, and I was never going to go back and be that person that I was before I started. I would, to this night, I've not be, gone back to being that same person. But um, I drank whenever I could after that. I just loved the sensation, the feeling of being there. I didn't get to drink to get drunk. I didn't necessarily want to be drunk. I wanted to be just on it, you know, that, mm, mm, yeah, everything's good. Everything's not good yet, but it's about to be good in about a half an hour, and and I'm going to be there when it happens. It, I love the anticipation alcohol gives me. It gives me that one, it's like a first date, you know. It's all going to be wonderful. Why even bother going on the first date, you know? Because it, you know it's going to be a huge disappointment, but that never stopped me with booze. I, I love drinking. And um, I, uh, my, my drinking story, I mean, a lot of you people, Dick especially, has heard me a million times. And I'm surprised he hasn't slid out of his chair right now and snoozed under the table. But um, my drunk log is terribly boring. I'm not like you. Um, I'm, I, you guys have exciting drunk logs. I used to come to the meetings when I was new just to hear the drunk logs because I sit there going, wow, you know, did you hear, did you hear that? You know, I, I've never come out of a blackout yelling, cover me, I'm going in. Um, <laughs> I've never come out of a blackout going, okay, cut the red wire. Um, it's just not, not my story. Uh, I've never come out of a blackout saying much of anything to tell you the truth. I've come out of a lot of black house with people saying stuff to me like, boy, I bet that hurt. Uh, <laughs> but because um, when I drink, I fall. And uh, it's my belief. I'm the kind of drunk who believes the fastest way down a long flight of stairs is to just, just relax. <laughs> I didn't fall. I just ceased fighting everything and everybody. Um, so, but I drank for 12 years. I did all the embarrassing things that I'm all on a minor scale. Um, I want to. I want to talk like Melissa. Melissa gave a wonderful talk this morning, and so did Cindy. And I, I want to thank her and both of them for that. But um, as an alcoholic, I was listening to Melissa talk so honestly about what happened to her. And and um, I don't want to labor the drunk a lot. I, I drank for 12 years. I drank poorly, obviously. If I was continuing to get there with any frequency, I wouldn't be here. Um, but I drank until I was physically ill. I was peeing blood. I remember breaking into my mother's house one night, and, and uh, uh, I don't know what happened, but I woke up in her nightgown. And... Um, <laughs> That was one of the top ten things I wasn't going to say on my inventory, I'll tell you that. Um, I, I had a Tupperware party drunk one night, and um, I just, I'm so full of shame to even admit it, but... Uh, I went to a friend of mine's house one night drunk, and his wife was having a Tupperware party, and there was an orange slicer there. And I don't know why, because I didn't eat that many oranges, but I wanted that orange slicer, <laughs> and I wanted that damn thing now. And she said, well, the Tupperware lady was this mad woman uh, who said, uh, I'll give you the orange slicer, but you got to have a party. And I said, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So she, I gave her that. She said, sign right here, and I signed for the, for the orange slicer. And... Uh, she called me about two weeks later and said, I'll be over Saturday. Well, like you agreed, because I've been, I was drunk that night. I didn't agree to anything. Well, you signed right on the sheet that you're going to have it in two weeks, and it's Saturday, and we're having the party at your house. And, and um, <laughs> to make a long story short, I started drinking a little early that day, and um, I wound up trashing my apartment and 
literally, according to reports, because I didn't remember this, um, through all of her, I was on a second floor apartment up a hill, so it was way down the hill in Santa Monica. I threw about 75% of her samples out the door <laughs> as I proceeded to demonstrate them in a most untupperware-ish way. Uh, I woke up at about three in the morning in bed with one of the guests at the party, a woman, and um, <laughs> and um, she said, do you remember what happened? And I said, no. And she said, good. And she got up and left. <laughs> I probably owe her amends, so I don't know where she is, but um, I, um, I got a call from the Tupperware lady about two days later, and she said, I don't have much to say about your methods, but you sold a damn lot of Tupperware. <laughs> So much so that I won a blender. <laughs> That's how I drank. Um, I also drank with bikers. I used to work with them. I wound up working at a, at a motorcycle parts manufacturing place. And every day at about 4 in the afternoon, I was in the shipping area. This guy come around with the parts puller, we'd come around with a shopping cart full of newspaper, and inside of it, you'd have about six or seven bottles of booze, and you could get two shots of whatever you wanted in a Dixie cup, and you just slide it across the counter on his way. So I always got my little shots in the afternoon, and I was happy as a pig in slop, I'll tell you. I was just enjoying myself at that job. I used to drink with these guys, and I was sort of the comic relief, because I certainly you can tell my Harley days are ahead of me. But... Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> But I just hang out with these guys, and anybody I was telling uh, uh, Daniel, anybody stepped in my, anybody who gave me any trouble in a bar got beaten up by these guys. I mean, uh, I mean, grabbed by the beard and smacked into walls and punched around, and nobody ever laid a hand on me. And uh, these guys were great friends, you know. And I enjoyed, no, I enjoyed drinking with them. I, I was just not intimidated by them. I thought they were just like I was, you know, and uh, and they were. And so I. Uh, wound up later getting a job and I wanted to be a writer and I got a job in publishing as a I was a, a receiving clerk at a bookstore and I was working there <laughs> and um, to launch my writing career and um, my life just rapidly started declining at that point and by I, I got married at that at 25 to a woman who I believed I loved and I don't make light of her she she had one major flaw and that is that she adored me and I, once that happens, I just can't, I don't know what to say. And I, I understand Cindy so well. I mean, just that, it made me feel embarrassed while she was talking this morning because I'm like that. Somebody likes me, I can't, you know, just don't, you know, please don't. But if, if someone is unattainable, I'm completely obsessed <laughs> with the unattainable and yet am constantly being pursued by people who actually care about me and don't want to be around them. Go figure that out. But, well, we did. But I, um, so I married this woman, and, and she wanted to help me, and she did what, what you described. She, she tried drinking with me, and she'd get about three or four drinks in her, and she'd go, oh, I, I, can't, I can't drink anymore. i got to get some, some soda or something. It's, I'm really starting to feel this. And um, I thought, that's the big difference between you and me. You're a quitter. <laughs> You gotta persevere. You gotta get through that stage of feeling feeling it until you just don't feel it. And uh, and she she had told me one time that when she drinks, she feels like she's losing losing control. And I thought, isn't that an interesting thing? Because when I drink, I just feel like I'm starting to get some control. I just feel like I'm starting to get something together in my life and feel that. And I I let that marriage go to seed. I mean, I, I did what I, I tried to be a husband, but it was incapable. I can't tell you the number of times that woman had to drag me into bed at night from the living room or the kitchen floor, you know, by one arm. And uh, the times that I would just, I knew I was going to get drunk and might get arrested, so I'd leave the car and walk about 25 blocks to a bar just to drink and be out of her earshot, you know, so I just don't have to hear it anymore or hear the questions like, how come you won't have dinner? You know, why don't we order dinner? I thought, why don't you back it up? 
where do we have to be in the next hour or three? You know, let me have another drink and I'll be fine. It's just the, the endless irritating questions. I don't like, <laughs> like, how many drinks have you had tonight? What's it to you? You know? And uh, that's how I, that, I lived that anxiety in that marriage. And, and the more I pulled back, the more she needed to be, to have a husband. And I was not it. And she wanted a guy who was trying to be a little more than a receiving clerk. And um, I worked for the L.A. Times. I, I, got, I went to college, and she helped put me through college. And I got my degree in journalism. And I just dr- put it in a drawer and shut the drawer because I was terrified to try to find work as a journalist. I was terrified of everything. I was afraid of everything. And, um, and so I just worked at this receiving doc job for 12 years. And I just... Uh, checked in boxes of books and priced them and put them on a shelf and, and did that for years and years and years and drank and drank and drank and wound up, uh, my wife wanted a divorce one day and um, they served me at work and uh, the subpoena guy served me at work and and uh, I just thought my life is just disintegrating, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'd been, by this time I wasn't very competent at this job, I'd been putting paperwork in my drawer for about, I don't know, about a year and um, uh, not working with it. And so I was going to probably be found out and lose that job too. And I had friends, and I didn't bother cultivating those friendships anymore. I don't know. I hear people in AA a lot say that they came in and they had no friends at all. All their friends were gone. Well, mine were all gone too, only I had dismissed them all. You know, I, I cut all my friendships loose when I realized that they were not like me. I just disconnect them and disconnect them until pretty soon... I was by myself, and I got to feel like a victim. You know, we disconnect all these friends, and then we get to feel isolated and alone. It's I, I tell the story because it illustrates my, my state of mind, and I'm sure a lot of people in here, too. When I was a kid, because, see, I live with big expectations. I have big expectations about what's going to happen. And Clancy talked about this when I was brand new. I heard him say that uh, we have huge expectations for things, and when we don't meet the expectations, when we fail to hit the expectations... We raise the bar, you know, so that we can fail again. Oh, that didn't work. Now I'm going to really ratchet it up there to see if I can do it, you know. And it's just, it's, it's insanity. And um, I had these big expectations about everything. And my, my, when I was a kid, um, my parents were a little concerned about me because you can tell that something was turning in the family pictures. Uh, I was looked like the kid who was probably most likely to become the neighborhood assassin. Um, more than anything, but I was just a dark, dark kid. I was always in the corner of the room at family gatherings, glowering. And, uh, and my mom and dad said, and now these are people with no money. Got to remind you of that. And they said, well, if you could play a musical instrument, what would you like to play? And I said, the piano, because I knew what, what was coming up. And the likelihood of getting a piano in that house was about as likely as having the Mercury 7 capsule delivered there. So I just said, piano. So, I, you know, months passed, and I came home from school right before the holiday vacation in December, and in our living room was a brand-new Kohler & Campbell piano with a big red bow on it, and they bought this piano for me. My parents had gone into hawk for this piano. I knew, and I looked at that thing, and I was mad because I never said I wanted to learn to play the piano. I just want to play the piano, you know? You get it. I don't want to sit down and do finger exercises and all that stuff. I want to sit down, flip the key cover back, and just start to play, you know? That was the fantasy. My great fantasy would be to come into a place like this, walk over to the piano while everybody's having a conversation, flip the cover up easily, and start to play. (laughs) <laughs> just just idling, playing, just making up as I go along, and pretty soon the conversation would stop all throughout the room, and the women would have tears in their eyes looking over, <laughs> and the men would be livid. <laughs> and eventually the best-looking dame in the room would kind of slither through the crowd and get right up next to me as I, as I closed the key cover and sauntered over to the bar, lean against the bar and order a drink and she'd get up next to me and grab me by the back of the pants and the, and the collar and say, I want you now. <laughs> 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 and, 
and, and, and I would say, no. <laughs> because somewhere I heard chicks dig it. But I, um, unfortunately, I never had a chance to put that into practice or test it. But um, that was my idea of playing the piano. Not sitting down, dan, 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 No, 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 I'm not going to do that. If you can sit down and just play the piano, it's easy for you. You know, the hell with you if you can play the piano. <laughs> and that's, that's, it's complex, but follow me here. It's, um, <laughs> so I, I, but that's just one little microcosm of how I treated everything in the world. If you can do it and you do it really well, it must be easy for you. And therefore it's harder for me. And why would I even bother to compete? Because if you pour it on, I'm going to lose. Turn that piece off. Now, if I tried to do this over here, I can't do it naturally. I've got, I really don't quite understand it. But rather than try to learn to do it, I would just click it off and move on to something because it was easy for you. It's easy for them. It's easy for everybody out in the world to live with each other. But it takes a lot of work when you can see the big picture and all the interconnections of things in the world like I can see them. I used to see them at the Humdinger Bar all the time. I'd sit in there and see the big, you know, you, there's a point where you can just see it. It's, it, it's like a big thing that you can lay down on the bar and, and see the big world picture. And, um, and a lot of the people in the humdinger saw it too. And uh, <laughs> I drank there for years. And I, but this marriage failed. I wound up on the 11th of June of 1981. I'd been in therapy for a couple of years. Um, wasn't going very well. And um, I went to a meditation retreat in Santa Barbara that the therapist was having. Um, I didn't want to go, but I figured it'd be good to get on her good side because uh, I was lying in therapy anyway, so why not? But uh, I, I, therapy didn't work for me, and I, I think therapy is a wonderful thing. I'm not a therapy basher. I think that therapy works for everything except alcoholism, though. So I don't think therapy is a treatment for alcoholism because the prerequisite for it working is honesty. <laughs> and if you are a drinking alcoholic, you don't know what honesty is. I didn't know. I thought I knew what it was, but I had a huge <laughs> scaffolding of lies built around everything to, to protect what little I had left to try to preserve inside. I was feeling, and it wasn't anybody else's doing. It was my own. I was just crumbling inside and drinking, and I, I couldn't get my life going. I was 30 years old. So I went to this meditation retreat thinking, maybe this will help. Maybe I can meditate and get a spiritual center. And I got drunk before I went up there. And, uh, I thought I was coming off a hangover on the way up there, and I thought they'll have some sacramental wine or something, you know, because it's a there, it's it's a it's a meditation retreat. So I get up there, park. It's bumper to bumper. There's parking. All the cars park in this big, you know, mishmash of parking, and I'm in the middle of it. And I get up there, and I she said, "What can I get you to drink?" Because we're all in the main guest house. And I said, "I'll have a glass of wine. That sounds good." And she goes, she laughed and said, "Well, we don't have any wine." Oh. What do you have? She goes, well, we have some herb tea. <laughs> herb tea just isn't going to make it tonight. Um, they didn't even have Lipton regular tea with just a little bit of a jolt in it. It had to be herb tea, you know, one nighty night tea, uh, whatever the old ladies drink. And, um, Something with jasmine and rose hips in it, you know. And, oh. and I, I started losing it then, but I couldn't tell anybody. Then the next day we went on a guided meditation in the morning, which for those of you who haven't been in therapy, it's where they where where you lay on your back on the floor with a bunch of other people, like in the hubs of a, like the spokes of a wheel, with all your heads together, and you lay there. And the meditation leader guides you through these things. I got guided to a field. And it was a sunny day, and I could hear the birds and the wind blowing. And I could, we got to a waterfall. We're looking at the waterfall. And then we get into the water, and we start to bathe ourselves. And the water turns red, and it washes away all our anger. And it turns green, and it washes away our feelings of jealousy and envy. And it turns blue, and it washes away our sadness. And we're going through the entire Sherwin-Williams catalog uh, <laughs> attached to, a, to, a, to whatever. And I'm laying there, and everybody, you know, is just, and all I could do was think, I am on a floor. 
I'm in a room. There are people here, and I don't like herb tea. And I don't like being here. I could feel the, the shag and the carpet just coming up through my shirt, you know. And, uh, and I, was, I was detoxing already. I was coming off this hangover, and I, I thought, oh, my God, oh, i got to get out of here. And she said, okay, now I want you to step back from the waterfall and look at it and look through the waterfall, and you can see where your life will be in five years from now. And I looked through that waterfall, and I saw myself. It was the only time I was even in this meditation. Uh, the rest of the time I was thinking about what was, why do I feel so uncomfortable? Let me out of here. Sex, sex, sex. Uh, 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 money, freedom, the big picture, all that stuff's going through my head. And she said, look through that waterfall and see where your life is going to be in five years. And I, for some reason, I don't know why, I looked through the waterfall and I saw myself hanging from the back, from the back of the door of my bathroom with my, the belt of my robe around my neck and dead. That's what I saw when I looked through after this guided meditation of where my life is going to be five years from now. And I saw that and I just thought, why am I even here? I knew what I had to do. And she said, okay. Then she really, after it was over, everybody's yawning and stretching. Oh, you yeah, know, that was so good. And she said, I want you to all go out on the meditation grounds and I want you to think about your life for the next five hours. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I got a better idea. Why don't I just put my face right up by the grill of your car and you floor it? Um, because my life is going nowhere. And um, I went out on the meditation grounds. I wandered as far away from everybody else as I could get. And I sat there and I just sat there thinking, my life is over. I'm going to, I want to die and I wish I could die. And whatever it takes to die, I wish I had it. I can't do it. I can't. I have my belt off. I was going to hang myself at this meditation retreat, which is grounds for a, a refund, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but um, I was out of my mind, and I sat there thinking, this must be what despair is, because I want to be dead. I don't want drama. I don't want all that stuff. I just want to be gone. I just want to be sucked up into the air and disappear and go wherever dead people go but I just don't want to be sitting here trying to get out of this hole that I'm in that I can't get out of. I don't know where to stand to get out of it. I don't know what to take to get out of it or grab, or I don't know what position to get in to get out of it. I just don't know. I would rather be dead. If I could be dead, that would be great. And I got something that hit me right in this, right in the soul. And this is, this sounds wacky if you're new, but I, I guarantee you this is what happened. I heard a voice that sounded like a voice, but it wasn't really a voice. It was from inside. And it said, you are exactly what you fear. And I still love you. And I felt completely loved from the base of my soul all the way through me for about 30 seconds. I just felt completely loved and comfortable. And I thought, oh, shit, now I'm going crazy. I don't know where that, because it, it went away. And I, I was trying to blink it off, you know, to figure out what was happening. I thought I was hallucinating. And I sat there, and I sobbed for probably four hours in that place. I could not pull it together to get back to the meditation. And I finally got back there. I didn't talk to anybody. I just went to had dinner, and I went to bed. I, I laid in bed that night, and I slept for the whole night, got up the next day, and went home. And I didn't realize what happened at the time, and that was that... Um, what I believe, I didn't know what that was until much, much later after I'd been in this program for a while. But I realized that I had finally given up. I'd finally dropped every bit of resistance I had to the presence of a loving creator in me to let him out to play. It wasn't like it came to me from the outside at all. It came from me from the inside and spoke to me inside of, inside of myself. And I didn't feel afraid at all at that point while it was happening I didn't feel afraid when I finally got my notion of what it was is when I got afraid and um, I went home from that retreat and I was I didn't take a drink for about four days I thought maybe if I quit drinking that'll help and oh surprise surprise um, I started to get the shakes I started to, I forgot how to walk the second day I, I literally was going to the mail room to get mail for this bookstore and my legs gave out and I had to sit on a planter for about a half an hour and try to figure out how to walk again. I um, 
was having auditory hallucinations in my car where I would hear the I'd hear the same Steely Dan album playing over and over and over again. And my stereo hadn't been hooked up for years in this car. Uh, it was a beaten up, crapped out Volkswagen 67 Bug with no reverse. I had to park on a hill every night facing down with no one in front of me. Those are the requirements. Downhill, no one in front of me. You'd think maybe getting the transmission fixed would have been better, but I was willing to do this. Um, it, the car also, if you put the key in, you had to pull it out by about a sixteenth of an inch to get it to turn to start. So I would do that and pull it out a sixteenth of an inch. I did that all the time. I adapted to everything. We adapt. I mean, I, why go to all the trouble of getting it fixed when I can adapt? I can always find a spot on the hill with no one in front of me. And... Um, My, I talk about this neighbor I have. Um, his name was Tom. Tom lived across the street from me. Tom's not an alcohol. Tom's wife still lives there with their two children who are my kids' age, ages. And Tom was just a really good neighbor, really great guy. He was a set builder at one of the, a lot of the different studios. And um, big, strapping guy, uh, probably six foot eight, and, and friendly and loving to his kids. And, and he got pancreatic cancer about two years ago in, in October. And... Um, he went in for surgery, so I saw his wife, and I was asking her how the surgery went. She said, well, as well as it could go. And I said, did they get what they needed to get? And she said, well, they didn't go in to get anything. Um, they went in to take out parts of other organs so that the tumor would have room to grow so that he could have Christmas with the children before he dies. So they had to take out parts of his stomach and parts of his intestine and good parts of him inside so it would give the tumor a place to grow so he wouldn't be in excruciating pain and he could have a, a, a comfortable Christmas with his children. And I thought, and I mean no trivialization of what happened to this man because he was a great guy, but uh, I thought, isn't that exactly what alcoholism does to people who have it, that we cut out perfectly good parts of our lives, cut away perfectly good people just to let the disease have room to grow? Because I can't stop it by myself. I can't stop it. And my idea of, of trying to get you know, set up, set the backfire on it and start taking out pieces of myself so that I don't have to change my habit of, of getting drunk, which is the only thing that I, I really enjoy anymore. It's the only thing that makes me feel like a person, and I'm losing that. And um, the fourth day after I had been uh, had that experience at the meditation retreat, I got a call from my soon-to-be ex-mother-in-law who said, you know, um, Debbie... My sister-in-law gets out of the hospital, out of the detox in um, a couple of days, and she needs a ride to an AA meeting. Can you give her a ride to a meeting? I thought, yeah, I'll give her a ride. That's, that's fine. I'll do her a favor. Uh, I've been separated from my wife for about 20 minutes, so I thought, you know, Debbie, Debbie and I have to speak the language of the heart. and um, <laughs> Or South. But I... Um, I just stupidly said I would give her a ride. I, and... By all means, by all rights, Debbie should have been driving that night. I picked her up. Now, you got to get a picture of this because I'm not the same guy that picked Debbie up. I had shoulder-length hair. I had deerstalker hat that I wore, Sherlock Holmes hat with sunglasses, very cool, with a Oxford or well, a tweed jacket with an Oxford shirt buttoned to the neck with a wool sweater vest and dirty jeans and boots. And it was about 109 that day. <laughs> and I picked Debbie up in the car. And I was also having those hallucinations where you get gnats in the peripheral vision. And when you turn to look at them, they go away. <laughs> but then when you go to commence talking to the person in front of you again, right back again, and they start hovering. So all you have the power to do is brush them away, you know? So... <laughs> I, I picked Debbie up. I was hearing people in the back of my car going, Charlie. You know, and, and so I'm driving along. I got Debbie in the car. She, we're go she's bubbly. She looked great. She was a beautiful woman anyway, but she'd just been beaten up by drinking. And when I picked her up, I hadn't seen her for about a month, and she looked wonderful. She had 22 days of sobriety. And she had been going to three meetings a day in this recovery place. And she looked amazing. There's something completely different about her. I'm driving along looking, you know, and 
whoa. And uh, Charlie, and she's going. <laughs> Debbie, just don't give him the dignity of turning around. Okay. And I just, what? So um, it was about a 25-minute drive from where I picked her up to the meeting we went to in Tustin, California, on a Sunday night. It was about the 15th of June of 1981, and uh, or thereabouts, and she 12-stepped me in the 20 minutes it took to get to that meeting with 22 days of sobriety. And she saved my life. I've got 24 and a half years. So I'll have 25 years if I'm lucky in June. And um, that woman gave me that in that little car ride to that meeting. She just gave me some, she gave me something that I didn't have before, and that was some hope that I could see something in her. And I think that's exactly what happens. That experience that I had at the meditation retreat was not about me. It was a an inkling of something inside of me that maybe somebody else could see, that I couldn't see myself, that just gave me some notice that it was there. If I wanted it, that it was there. But I could see it in Debbie, and I wasn't even looking for it. I just saw something different in her. And I pull up to the meeting, and she said, oh, I'll, I said, I'll come back and get you in about an hour and a half. And she goes, well, why don't you come into the meeting with me? And I thought, I'm not really an alcoholic. Um, I have a drinking problem, but I'm not an alcoholic. And she said, well, it can't hurt you. I mean, you'll probably hear something in here that will help you if you're trying to stop drinking. Okay, so I found a parking space that had no one in front of me and um, <laughs> went into the meeting, and I sat through that meeting, and when it came time to identify as an alcoholic, I stood up and said, I'm Charlie, I'm an alcoholic, and then sat down, and oh, I felt awful. I went out for coffee with these people, uh, with all of our friends from the detox. You know, there's about 30 of them. We go out for coffee, and they're all chattering away, and I'm just feeling terrible because I don't, I don't have a wristband, A, and B, because um, they wore it as a sign of solidarity, you know. And, um, and I went back to that meeting the next week because she was going to take a chip, you know. And aside from that, the first meeting I went to, they brought me up to the literature table to get a big book. Get a big book, Charlie. I thought, well, I got, you know, I work in a bookstore. There's a lot of big books. What? <laughs> How big a book are we talking about here? You know? <laughs> so they brought me up to get a big book, you know. I thought, does it have a title or something, you know? Uh, anything. It's like, brown drink. That's brown drink. <laughs> and <laughs> big book. <laughs> Many people. And, uh, <laughs> So, so I went up to get a big book, and the woman informed me that they were five dollars, and I only had I had three dollars in my pocket, and she said, "This was I remember this vividly." She said, "Look, save a dollar to put in the basket when it comes around. I'll take the two dollars, and when you get the money, if you can, pay it back. You know, if not, don't worry about it. Here's the book. Here's a meeting directory. Enjoy." So I took it and. The next, I thought, you know, as I'm walking away from the table, I felt terrible because I owed every bank in Southern California. I owed my boss about $300 in bad checks. I owed my ex-wife a lot of money because I tapped out her credit card. And now, now I owe AA <laughs> three bucks. <laughs> How deep is this pool anyway? Because I keep... I keep going farther down. I don't feel any bottom yet. <clears throat> so I came back the next week to see Debbie get, because she was going to get a chip <laughs> to go with the big book. I could see both of those things. And so, <laughs> so I went to see Debbie get her 30D chip, and she said, you know, and, and she said it as I swear to God, it was everything I could do to keep from laughing in her face, because that was how I was. She said, if you get 30 days sober, you can get a chip, too. <laughs> and a hug. A chip and a hug. Well, now. That sounds wonderful. How do we start? Because I haven't had a... 
I haven't had a drink for about 20 days. I've been pissing blood for three months. I can't go to the doctor and tell him that because I don't want to be embarrassed to tell him that, and he won't like me, so I didn't go to the doctor. I'm in the middle of a divorce. I'm dying inside. Oh, I need a hug. You know, get away from me. We came back, and she got her chip and her hug, and uh, everybody applauded and wept. We went out for coffee afterwards, and everybody talked, and I just whipped. You know, flies around. Uh, I was pretty. I was much better by then. But I um. The ne- the third week I went back to that meeting because Debbie got drunk the following Tuesday and didn't get back to AA for nine years. And to this day, I don't know if she's still going to meetings. I saw her a couple of years ago. I used to call her on my birthday and thank her for bringing me to Alcoholics Anonymous, and she would always sort of laugh and go, well, "I really, I just you gave me a ride. I didn't really bring you there." And I said, "Well, I I think of it as you bringing me there, and I really appreciate it." But she uh, she saved my life. This 22 day sober woman uh, gave me what uh, what amounted to uh, just a, a lifeline. Just threw it out there and let me grab at it. And um, so I went back to that meeting and and I was I was scared because my first reaction when she drank was, oh great, she gets to drink again. I'm stuck in AA. <laughs> no, this is how I was thinking. I, I'm stuck in Alcoholics Anonymous, and now she gets to go drink again. She brought me here, and now I'm stuck here while she gets to go out and drink. That's not right. That's not right. I don't like that. And they made me a greeter at the meeting, which was I was the scariest greeter you've ever seen. Um, there was a woman in my group named Leslie who was as wacky as could be. She was one of these windshield kicking out on a date drunks, okay? <laughs> she, all she had to do was turn around and look at a guy in the meeting and he would freeze, you know? <laughs> uh, and she came up to me one time and she said, you used to work at Santa Monica College in the bookstore, didn't you? And I said, yeah. She goes, I was terrified to go in there because of you. You were really scary. <laughs> I thought, damn. <laughs> uh, Got Leslie on the run, but I um, but I, I went back. I kept, that night that I was there after Debbie drank, a speaker named Keith Carpenter was there. Keith talked about he was he was big and robust and he really gave it. He gave so much enthusiasm. He was like Larry, just firing up the team, you know, to to go do battle. And he got me fired up. And and people at the meeting said, you know, go up and thank him. You got to go up and thank the speakers. I think Chuck Chamberlain the week before. And, and uh, he was a speaker, and I, I didn't understand a word he said. I mean, he was, you know, this crazy old man who laughed about every 30 seconds. And, um, and I went up to thank him, and he said, how many, how many days? Are you a newcomer? I thought, well, what, how would you guess? You know? Uh, and and uh, he said, how long are you sober, boy? And I said, I guess about 15 days. And he goes, oh, God, I love you. And he grabbed me and kissed me. And that's, that's where I caught alcoholism, actually. But... Um, <laughs> Right from right from Chuck Chamberlain, but I uh, but I went I went up to thank Keith at this meeting, and Keith, you know, he's a big robust guy, and he says he says, uh, where are you? How many meetings are you going to? And I said I go to four, and he goes you should be going to seven. And I said well you know four a month is ad- adequate as far as I'm concerned. I go I go every Sunday night like clockwork, and um, he said I'm talking about seven a week. And I thought, that's excessive. And he said, how often did you drink? And I said, all right, I get it. And um, I said, but you know, by the time I get off work and get home, it's too late to go to a meeting. I, I, li- I worked about 40 miles away from my house. And he said, well, why don't you go to meetings by where you, where you work? I thought it was like going to a particular parish when you're a Catholic. You know, you go to the one in your neighborhood. You don't go to one two miles away or in the next city. You go to your neighborhood parish. I said, okay, well, I work at Santa Monica College. He goes, great, here's an address. He gave me this address on on Sunset Boulevard. Wednesday night, you'd be there. Be at that meeting, and I'll be looking for you. And it wouldn't be hard because he was like a, a lighthouse. And so, okay, so I that Wednesday night, I drove over to that meeting. I got there one minute before the meeting started, went in there, and I've been going to that meeting ever since. For the last 24 years, I've been uh, at that meeting and active and, and uh, have been sponsored and am sponsored in that meeting and have sponsored guys who are still in that group. And, um, and I owe that to Keith because Keith would, I would never have gone to that meeting had it not been for Keith Carpenter. And Keith died about two weeks ago. 
uh, with 42 years of sobriety. And uh, so his memorial is tomorrow, and I'm going to miss it, but I, uh, I owe that guy. He was just a, a, he's, he was a solid member of AA and, and certainly a, a good man. Um, so I, I started going to that meeting, and my, I got a sponsor to shut everybody up uh, to keep, <laughs> keep them from asking, do you have a sponsor yet? You know, and so I'd start to explain, they just walk away. And, um, <laughs> or I'd start to, they'd say, you better get commitments and get a sponsor. And I didn't, I didn't want a commitment, you know, I'm not going to stay here anyway. And, um, I finally got the sponsor and, and his name was Bill. And Bill, I asked him to sponsor me. He was really a nice guy up until the moment I asked him to sponsor me. <laughs> and then he, we went out for coffee and he sat me down and he's looking at me across the table and he said, are you willing to do anything I ask you to do to stay sober? And I said, yeah. And he said, good, because I want you to shave that silly mustache off, get your hair trimmed, and I'll see you at the men's stag on Friday, and we'll go from there. I thought, time out. Hold it. <laughs> What's that got? And he looked at me. He said, it's got nothing to do with AA. And I said, well, where in the big book? And he's, and I'm bluffing now because I hadn't read the big book. <laughs> uh, I knew, I, I suspected there was no chapter to the barber, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so, um, so he said it's not in the big book, and I looked. I just kept thinking, I don't, I'm not tracking this at all. <laughs> he said, "You just said that you were willing to do anything to stay sober, right?" And I said, "Yeah." And he said, "I just asked you to shave your mustache off, right?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "If you're not willing to shave your mustache off just because I asked you to do it, what makes me think you're going to be able to do the steps when it comes time to do those? They're a lot harder than shaving, sport." I just want to find out if you're a loser or not. I guess I'll find out Friday night. He got up and walked out of the coffee shop <laughs> before I had a chance to. Uh, <laughs> now I'm really upset, really upset. I'm 30 years old, and I'm getting, I'm getting grooming directions from a milkman. Um, I go, I get, I get in the bathroom, that, and I, I didn't shave right away. I waited a day. I wanted to sweat him a little bit. And then uh, I, sh I stood in front of that mirror, and I got the same experience that I had at the meditation retreat. From inside, I realized if I fight one more thing, I'm not going to make it. I had about maybe a month, maybe a month and a half of sobriety, then, and I just took the razor, shaved my mustache off, and I went to the meeting that Friday night, and Bill came walking up and put his arm around me and said, well, here we go, sport. And uh, he's been my sponsor ever since. And um, that guy has walked me through everything in my life. He's walked me through my first divorce. He's, and I don't mean walk me through in a, just a, just a uh, attitudinal sense. He walked me through it by driving me to a meeting with a counselor so that I could go in and meet with my soon-to-be ex-wife and have a place to land when I came back down because I didn't know what was going to happen to me. I didn't understand. I couldn't talk to her. I didn't know what to say to her. And she would just scream at me in this counselor's office about, what have they done to you in that AA thing? You're just sitting there staring at me, and you won't say anything. And I, I was told just to not judge and not be angry and not react. You just don't interact like that. Just listen. And I'm listening, and I get back down in the car, and I get down there, and I'm sitting there in the car, and we're driving away, and it's miles from, from our, we're going to go to a meeting now. So we're driving to the meeting, and we go for about 15 minutes, and no one says a word in the car. And Bill goes, so um, how'd it go? And I just burst into tears in the car, just sobbing away. And he just drove around for a while until I calmed down, you know. And this guy has done the same thing with me all the time. I mean, I've been through lots of different things with Bill, and he brought me, he gave me directions on all the steps, and I I've taken them all over and over and over again, because because sobriety is like playing whack-a-mole, you know? Um, <laughs> you get three of those little bastards down, and there's that last one, and you go to get it, and the other three pop up again, you know? <laughs> It never ends. It's like giving a it's like trying to give a cat a bath, you know. It's it's endless. And um, I wound up. He said, if you want to be able to complain about your job, you have to go find a new job. And I thought I don't want to do. You know, I didn't say it, but I didn't want to do that. And but I wanted the right to complain. So I, I, I he said, why don't you go back to school? And that was the last thing I wanted to do was go back to college because I, I had a degree. He said, well, go back and get your master's degree in English. And so I went back to Loyola Marymount University. I didn't know how to do it. I went back there. I, this is how I deal with things. 
I have to surrender myself to the power that's greater than I am. When I got on that campus at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, it's a big campus, it's a beautiful campus, I didn't know a thing about anything on that campus. So what did I do? I asked the gardener who was standing there, come here a second, I need to find out how to get an application to go to the school. And he knew where to go, told me how to get there. Went there and got the application, filled it out. About a month later, I get a letter back, you're accepted. Oh, great. <laughs> I don't have any money to go to college. I told Bill that. He goes, well, go apply for a loan. You know, and go back there. There's another gardener. These guys seem to know everything. So I, uh, <laughs> I, had to, I had to go with the gardener, and then when I got in the building, I couldn't find the office, and I had to go with the janitor. I had to find my way to where I could go to apply for a loan. I applied for the loan. I wasn't going to get it because I had lousy credit. I mean, zero credit. A year into my sobriety, I had to sit down with another member of AA named George W., who lives in... in uh, in uh, Georgia, and George sat down for a whole year and helped me pay off my debts. Day, week by week, he sat down and told me which checks to write, which ones to hold, which ones to write letters to, and that man patiently led me through making amends to all these institutions that I owed money to and people. And uh, But at that time, I didn't have any credit at all. I applied for this student loan. I get the student loan. Now I'm really screwed. i got to go to college now. So I go to college. I'm there for one semester. Meanwhile, I'm still working at the bookstore. I worked at a college bookstore in Santa Monica. And I'm there in the, in the back room one day, and, and uh, the dean of the English department came down, and she said, she said, are you, are you in college right now? Are you back in graduate school? And I said, yeah, because she talked to another woman I worked with. And she said, I need, I've, got I've got 30 students that I don't have a teacher for, for an English one class. Can you teach that? And I said, I don't know. I don't have a credential. And she said, that's not a problem. We'll get an emergency credential for you. Okay. I don't have a... Uh, uh, <laughs> I, have to, I have to work in the morning on the receiving dock. That's when all the deliveries come in. And she goes, academics overrides student services. This dame's got all the answers, you know. Uh, so I said, let me call somebody first. And I called Bill. And Bill said, take the job. So, you know, I thought, I'm in college, for, I'm only in the university for one semester. If I stayed in there for a year, I would have my subject matter down a little more. I'd be able to plan ahead for teaching. I'd be able to really work my curriculum to go toward that goal. All I heard was, <laughs> on the phone. <laughs> he just hangs up on me when I start doing that stuff. So I went back and said, okay, I'll take the job. And she goes, oh, thank you. You start Tuesday. Here's the book. And now it's Friday. And I thought, I don't do Tuesday, you know. I don't know any. I got this book. I don't know how to teach English. What do I do? Gather them around the table and say, okay, watch this. Here's a pen, all right? Everybody see it? Watch. Watch this. Okay, I'm writing. Look. There you go. Got it? Go do it. So I went home, and, and my spot, I called Bill and said, they, I got hired. And he said, well, I said, I don't know anything about the subject matter. And he goes, I guess you're going to have a busy weekend then, aren't you? <laughs> So I dug out reference books, and I'm writing the syllabus. And I, had sp I spent hours on the syllabus, and, and I got to class the next Tuesday. And you know, you know how that goes when you got to do something really urgent. You you just start getting those hysterical bowels and stuff. And uh, <laughs> and I'm pacing outside the classroom, peeking in the little window, and they're all sitting in there, you know, waiting. And finally, it's eight o'clock, and I, I walk into the class. I sweep in, and <laughs> Bill said, just uh. Just, just pretend you're Ronald Coleman and go in and throw it to him. I thought, okay, I can do that. So I go in and casually walk in, throw my things down on the table, tell him who I am, walk back and forth. I get my syllabus handed out. I explain my entire syllabus and what's required of them and how the class is going to be and the papers they're going to have to do for the next semester. And now i got an extra 45 minutes left in the class. <laughs> And I said, okay. And I'm thinking to myself, I learned all the parts of speech this weekend and how to teach them. So I guess they're going to learn those. So I said, okay, we're going to do the parts of speech now. Take out a notebook and uh, follow along. And I turn around and get a piece of chalk, start writing on the board. I'm writing noun, verb, adjective. And I write them all down. And I turn around, and all these kids in, in this college class are... And I'm thinking, they bought it. <laughs> It was almost like the power that you get to say, 
All right, clear off your desk and take out a clean sheet of paper. I've always wanted to do that. But I, uh, <laughs> I taught that class for seven years, you know, uh, and, and among other classes at that school, and worked at the bookstore in the afternoon so that my students could come down the alleyway behind the bookstore and see me jumping up and down in the dumpster to get the boxes down. <laughs> and they'd go, Mr. Arnold, wave. I got an apron on. Freaked them out. That gives you lots of power when you act crazy like that. But um, So then the next year, the pain of teaching high school wasn't enough. I got a job as a high uh, or pay, teaching college wasn't enough. I got a, a position as teaching a high school class uh, or high school classes. And I, I told you about an experience I had with a kid this afternoon. I, I love teaching high school. I love these kids. I really, I learned more about love and more about AA and the program and teaching high school than I learned in coming to AA meetings sometimes. Because I, we have two, I, I got sober with two nuns, which shows you that God does indeed have a sense of humor. And um, <laughs> and so I went up to Sister Sister Mary and asked, she was from, they're both from Ireland. And um, I went up to Mary, who was in education. They were both in education. I said, how do you how do you talk to the kids in class? I mean, how do you keep control? And she goes, oh, you just talk to them like little newcomers. You let them know that you've got something they need, and if they'll go to any lengths to get it, you'll be happy to give it to them. And if they care this much about their grade, then you'll care this much about their grade. But if they only care that much about their grade, then that's how much you care about it, and let them know that. So I did went in, I gave them that speech without the accent. And... Um, <laughs> And I, I love teaching. I was a, believe me, it was a lot of stress and a lot of pressure, but I really enjoyed it. But then just when I thought I was settled in a career, I was my seventh year of teaching, I just signed my contract for the next year, I get an opportunity to write a Bugs Bunny cartoon out of the blue. Now, I had not been a writer because I realized that writing involves more than thinking about writing. I, 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 it requires actual motion of pencil on paper. And... Um, but you know what? If I can't do it perfectly, then why bother? You know what I mean? I'm going back to that again. But, uh, you know, and if you can do it well, screw you. But I, um, but I wound up doing journal writing with my students while I was in class because I thought if I'm asking them to do it, sponsor message, uh, maybe I should do it too. And so I'm doing writing with them in class. And after a couple of years of that, I was writing every day. And uh, I got an opportunity through a buddy of mine, Mark, in the program. He, uh, he was meeting with an animator, and I got in a conversation with this guy, and he, a couple months later, called me back and said, you're a writer, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, in a matter of speaking. And um, he said, well, I need somebody to write a Bugs Bunny cartoon. He was directing a, a, a cartoon at Warner Brothers. And so I gave him an idea, and I gave him about six more, because if, if one's good, six are better. <laughs> and um, and he went in and sold it, and he called me back and told me that he, he'd sold it. And he want, I said, who's going to write the script for you? And he said, well, you are. You're off for the summer. Get down here and get working uh, on it, so I went down and worked on this thing. And about a year later, I was working part time there. I leave high school, get in my car, and drive over to Burbank and and uh, work there for the evening. And then uh, then a year after that, I got hired um, by the studio full time. And the woman said, my boss, or the producer said, um, how's it feel being the newest employee here? And I said, well, I don't know about me, but you just made my mother the happiest woman on earth, you know. And so she said, really, what's your mom's address? And so I gave it to her, and she wrote my mom this nice letter on Warner Brothers Stationery uh, saying that she was really happy that I was working there. My mom kept that on her refrigerator for about 15 years, uh, or not that long, but about 10 years. She'd show it to any, anybody who'd walk in the house. My mother, did you see this? You know, and, um, so, and that gets back to the program, and I'll, I'll tell you a couple of stories, and I'll sit down. My mom, um, I, I made amends. I made amends to the IRS. It was not impossible. There, were, there was actually a person there who talked to me and sent me a contract to sign to pay back the money that I owed them. And with George's help and with help with the encouragement of people who had done it in AA, I managed to pay back my, the money I owed them and the money I owed pretty much everybody. Um, but I wasn't able to make amends to my father because my dad died when I was about 22. 23, I just turned 23. And um, he died of cancer. And I could not get down to see him in the time that he was dying of cancer. I just could not get out of the bar long enough. I, I went down maybe twice to see him while he was dying. And uh, it was really, I'd go to the place called the Ore House in Santa Monica and drink there. And I just would say, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i come down and see you this weekend. And I'd just not get out. I wouldn't leave. I'd just sit there and just was, 
struggling with that. And, um, and so uh, my mom and I always had a difficult relationship, too. I mean, I'm sure she, she wanted to protect me because she had these other babies that had died. And all my life, if I'd go out on a date or something, I'd come home and my mom would say, oh, thank God you're home. Every time I heard a siren, I thought it was you. You know, that kind of, and then she'd tell me about the brothers that died and all that stuff. And she'd suffered. She'd suffered a lot, but I never wanted to hear it. I just want to hear that crap. You comparing me to these dead people, leave me alone. I just was angry at her and never understood her grief. Never accepted for a moment that maybe she was working through something and grieving and trying to protect me in, in whatever way she could. And I heard Sheila Armstrong from uh, Oklahoma talk one time about 10 years ago. Uh, about having lost, she had twins and lost one of them at birth, and the kind of grief she went through. Ooh. And it opened something up in me. It just opened up an understanding of my mom that I didn't have before. But I had to hear it through another AA member before I could go back to my mom and, and look at her differently, just look at her differently, and not try to manipulate her and work her around, because I got money from her and used her for dough and used her for all kinds of things, places to flop. And um, and my mom never asked anything of, it, of me, you know, for it for doing that. And so uh, my sponsor my first year told me I was going to go to the big Clancy Thanksgiving thing we do. Clancy leads the meeting. It's participation by number, and they have a potluck. And it's a big Pacific group to do. I've been sober in that group for 24 years now, and I've never been to that Thanksgiving thing, never have been there. And Clancy called me on it one time, and I told him, you know what, um, Bill suggested the first year that I spend Thanksgiving with my mom and my stepfather and uh, be a son. So I did that. I just went down there and tried to be a son. And I didn't want to be there the first few years, but I went, you know, and did that clumsy, awkward thing that we do to try to make living amends to our parents because she didn't want to hear the amends. When I'd start to give, make amends to her, she'd say, we tried to be good parents to you, you know, and that, I'd have to abandon ship at that point. So I just went down and was trying to be a son to her. And then I heard Sharon talk one time. I'd have heard Sharon say it many times before this, but it finally registered when she said she made amends to her dad by just sending him checks every week and putting a note in it. So I sat down with my mom for my mom, and I started sending her checks of the money I owed her. I figured out how much I owed her and started sending her checks every week. I always put a card in it because Sharon inspired me to do that. And um, after about a year and a half, my mom was just delighted. She couldn't figure out why I was doing it. And um, I didn't announce it. I just started sending them to her. And we started to develop a somewhat awkward but a good relationship. I brought her to a couple of AA meetings with me. Um, she saw what was going on in my life, and she approved of it, you know. And, and she got sick uh, in 2000. She started really deteriorating fast. And, um, and the last thing my mom said to me was, I love you. That was the very last thing I heard my mother tell me. And she died about three hours later. And uh, I was glad to hear that because – and she loved – she told me before – when she was in better health that she thought that Alcoholics Anonymous was the best thing that ever happened to me. And she'd fought it all along. How come you have to keep going to that AA? Why don't you come down and visit me more? How come every time you come to see me, you have to go to a meeting at night? Guess. Um, <laughs> you're lucky I don't have, have them bring a panel in here. you know. Um, but I eventually made amends to my mom and paid back the money and had a relationship with her. And I, but I, couldn't, I hadn't made amends to my father, and my sponsor told me how to do it and when to do it, and I didn't do it. And I waited 10 years, and I was at an at a Al-Anon function and in, in uh, Orange County, and I was driving back, and it just hit me like that, that I'd heard Clint Hodges talk about it, making amends to his mom, and I was driving by within about two miles of the cemetery where my dad was. So I stopped, and I got at a convenience store across the street. I got scissors. I got paper towels. I got some Windex, and I got a carnation because my dad loved carnations, and I uh, went over to that place, and trimmed everything up around the, the headstone and found his grave at, at this Forest Lawn Cemetery and uh, sat down and just told him about you. I told him what I was doing. I said, I've been around AA for 10 years. I've been in AA. And my life is changing. And I'm really grateful for the things that you taught me that I ignored all my life. I just turned you off because of whatever reason. And I just feel like something's changed in me. And I want you to know that I always, and I just told him what was going on inside. And I got up and nothing happened. There wasn't a big shaft of light that came down or anything. I just drove away. But about three months later, I realized when I was talking to somebody in a meeting about my father that I realized he hadn't been disappointed in me. And I, all along, I thought my dad had been enormously disappointed in me as a son, that we had no interconnection at all. He was, he was way over here, and I was way over here all the time. 
And uh, I thought it was because he had been a Marine and he was disappointed in the fact that I wasn't exactly core material. And um, so I made those amends and I, I was emboldened by that. And I was sitting down with my mom at the kitchen table one time at her house and said, you know, uh, this, this is part of my inventory that my father had gotten up every morning. He was a farm boy, so he'd get up about four in the morning and he would make me a sandwich every day. And he would uh, make lunch for me and we didn't have any there was no funds in this house it was just bare minimum stuff but he'd make a sandwich for me and he'd put it in a bag and put chips and an apple or an orange or something in there fold it up write my name on it he had this distinctive handwriting and he'd set it by the door and then he'd go off to work in his little squishy soled shoes with the you know in his little gray workers outfit with his lunch box in his hand and i would get up in the morning and i walk out and i grab that lunch and i'd go to school and then walking across the property of the school the first thing I did was drop that lunch in the trash can and just keep walking because cool kids don't carry their lunch to school. Only dorks do. I don't need one more piece of evidence that I'm a dork. I would rather I would rather go hungry than to admit any more about myself than that. So I throw that lunch away every day. And every time I threw it away, I knew later after I wrote about this in my inventory that something tightened in my gut a little bit. Clancy talks about the screw that we get inside of our guts. It tightens up till we need something to relieve that. And that's what happened to me over the years. And eventually I couldn't even look at my dad because I knew, you know, that I was throwing that lunch away. And I, and I thought it was his disappointment I was seeing in his face. And it was me who was pushing him away. So I told my mom I had to make amends about it somewhere. So I sat down with my mom and I said, you know, I, dad used to make lunch for me every, every day for years. And I used to throw it in the trash when I went to school. And she said, I know. I said, how did you know? And she goes, well, your dad told me. I said, how did he know? And she said, well, he just asks you questions every so often about your lunch, and you always gave him the wrong answer. <laughs> He'd say, how was your bologna sandwich? And I'd say, it was great. And it was peanut butter. You know, Was that apple okay today? I looked at it this morning. I didn't. Yeah, it was great. It was perfect. And it was an orange. He didn't do it all the time. He just did it every so often. And uh, he knew. And I said, well, then, if he knew, why did he keep making it for me? And she looked at me across the table with a mixture of pity and just shaking her head, and I got it. The minute she looked at me, I got it. It was a pure act of love. It was it was not conditional on my reaction to it. He didn't want somebody to come back and throw on themselves at their feet. Larry talked about this today. It's just it's serving up lunch to someone he loved. And that's all that mattered to him was that he did the job, put the lunch out, and whatever I did with it was my business. His business was showing his love, and that was how he did it. My father never yelled at me or screamed. I mean, he, he bellowed about stuff, but he was never abusive to me. But he would make that lunch, and I would throw it away for years and years, and he knew it, and he kept making it. And what does that mean here? What it means here is that this is this kind of service that you see at a conference like this and that you see at meetings all over the world, that people go there and they, they perform acts of love in Alcoholics Anonymous. They sponsor people. They do something simple like set the meeting up and make some great coffee at my Wednesday night meeting. And, um, and they, they've got better things to do on an afternoon. On the afternoon of June the 15th of, of 1981, people there, it was a beautiful, sunny summer day, and people had better things to do that afternoon. But they made that lunch. I mean, they made that coffee, and I got to partake of it and enjoy it. So if you're new, it's being served up here every day. It's served up every night. In Alcoholics Anonymous. If you don't want it, it's okay. We understand that. We've been there. But we're not going to stop serving it. So whenever you decide you want it, it's here for you. It was here for me this weekend. It's here, and I can speak, I'm sure, on behalf of all the speakers who are here, that this has been served to us amply. There's no way we can give back. So I hope that uh, everybody stays and, and enjoys the rest of the conference. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.